Okay, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, my name is Charlie Nicol, and I'm a, a financial advisor for uh, Fidelity International. Um, and I specialize solely in the at retirement uh, market. So, today I'm going to give you a, a sort of a brief um, overview if this will work. Ah, there we go. So, um, so I'll give you a sort of a brief overview of, of the at retirement market. Uh, I'm going to cover three, three main sections. I'm going to start off with you know, the, the, the running up to your retirement, you know, what you need to be considering, uh, then move on to how, how retirement has changed. A lot of you in the room will be familiar that a couple of years ago, uh, George Osmond had a chance to announce some radical changes to the pension world. And then I'm going to spend the majority of the next half an hour on the actual at retirement market, you know, what, you know, what are your options. So before I begin, um, sort of the real, real point I want to stress today is, is pensions are a very complex area. Um, I, I, I deal with hundreds of customers a year. I look at you know, thousands of pension schemes. And the one thing that is really clear to me is every pension is different. Everyone's circumstances are different. And because of the, the number of changes that have happened over the years, um, you, you can't really underestimate them. And going out and getting the, the guidance and doing the research and, and getting the advice if need be is actually quite key to this. So you know, that's the first topic really, is just to say this is a complex area and doing your research is, is certainly the best place to start. So we start off with um, building up to retirement. Well, regardless of where you are in, in life, you know, retirement should always be on the forefront of your mind. Um, you know, the sooner you start saving, generally hopefully the better your retirement will be. Um, but there's key, three sort of key main areas that you want to be considering on the run up to retirement. That's you know, looking to perhaps consolidate some of your pensions, contributing obviously is very key, and also your investment strategy. So if we go pick out each one individually, you've got consolidating. Um, chances are in, in today's world, you, you, you've probably gone through employment with you know, a number of different employers. And with each employer, generally speaking, you'll get a pension scheme with each employer. So what you may find is by the time you know you went into your careers, you, you end up with multiple pension pots all dotted over the place, all over the place. So, so one advantage of consolidating is it allows you to bring everything into one place, and you can then you know see what you've got and manage it more effectively. Now you do need to be careful that consolidating isn't right for everyone. There are risks involved. Um, some pension policies, especially some of the older, old pension policies dating back to the 80s, for example, can have some valuable benefits contained within, within them. So you do need to be careful that you know, consolidating can be good, but it's not right for everyone. So do check with you know, the small print of the, the policy that you've got at home, speak to your provider. Um, also look at you know, what can your provider offer you as well. You know, they may be able to offer you what you actually want to get out of retirement. Um, the other thing you may want to just a, a sort of a point to note here is some schemes, there is, a, there is a, a rule called small pots commutation where if you've got a pot of, uh, of you know, it's quite small, then you can actually take that as a lump sum and it has, doesn't have the impact of triggering some, um, uh, what's known as a, the money purchase annual allowance, which basically reduces your, your ability to put money in each year. So if you have got small pots, then sometimes it can be worth keeping them where they are and then potentially looking to cash them in at a later stage. Um, the other main advantage of consolidating is easier administration. So you know, at least you've got everything in one place, you can see what you're dealing with, you get one set of paperwork through every year, your policy statement, etc. cetera. Um, but as I said, you know, do check before you do, you know, do embark on looking to consolidate everything into one place. Do check you know, what can your provider offer you. The next one is contributing. So contributing, obviously, is you know, in today's world with defined contribution schemes, um, is is the key to a you know to, to to your retirement. You know, if you don't contribute, then you're unlikely to have any money for retirement. Um, so you know, the first thing is if you're still working and you know your your employer offers you a pension scheme and they offer um, their own contributions, then you know, are you maximising their contributions as well? I mean, in, in a way, it's free money. Um, are you using your full allowances? You know, for some people, you know, you can actually put up to forty thousand pounds a year into a pension. You know, are you maximising your contributions and getting that tax relief? Um, for, for others who are you know, higher earners, you can, there is the option of potentially looking to carry forward unused annual allowances from previous years as well to top up your pension. 
Um, now, you do also need to be careful that if you have access to your pension under pension freedoms, then you may actually be restricted in what you can contribute into a pension. That's known as the money purchase annual allowance. So, so again, just, just check before you do anything, you know, will that trigger a, you know, a, a, something that may disadvantage me in the future? And then finally, with contributing, you, you tend to get the, 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 the effect of pound cost averaging. So every month you put money in, for example, you're buying it at a different price, and generally over the longer term, um, you tend to see that, that you, you benefit from, from the effect of buying in when the markets are low. And then we've got the investment strategy. So the investment strategy is crucial no matter what age you are and you know, how far away from retirement you are. You, know, you need to make sure that you're in a strategy that's you know, relatively suitable for your requirements and your attitude to risk. Um, you also, as you, as you approach retirement, you need to give consideration for what you want your pension pot to do. Do you want it to buy an annuity or do you want to go into drawdown? Because ultimately, the investment strategy you're, you'll be in will, will determine how successful you are at buying an annuity, for example. You know, just give you a, a basic example here, if, you know, with an annuity, the annuity that you get will be based on your fund value at the point that you buy the annuity. Now, if your funds are invested and, and, and heavily invested in high risk, volatile funds, and there is a, you know, a market correction on the day before you're due to purchase that annuity, you can see the value of your assets significantly reduce, and in turn, that will reduce your annuity as well. So you may be wanting to consider at that point do I start to de-risk my portfolio to give myself a bit more of a smooth landing into buying an annuity? So investment strategy is very, very key. So what I thought I'd do, I'd just quick, sort of, uh, do a quick snapshot of you know, how, you know, how retirement used to be and, and how it is today. So once upon a time, everything used to be very straightforward. You, 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 you work throughout your life, you'll get to a retirement age, which normally was your state pension age, and at which point your employer gave you a defined benefit scheme. Um, potentially you would have got your tax-free cash lump sum there as well um, and obviously your state pension would have started paying and that basically gives you your retirement you've got your guaranteed income sources the majority of which has got some inflation protection no doubt you've had your lump sum up front nice and simple now over the years there's been over more recent years in fact there's been some three key changes to retirement um, the first one is the, the rise of defined contribution schemes. And as most of you will be aware, not many companies now offer defined benefit schemes to, to, to new employees. Um, even some companies have actually closed down their defined benefit schemes for existing employees. Why is that? Well, basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's the risk to the company. It costs them money. They've got to ensure that they pay you an income over your lifetime. The biggest risk is there. How long are you going to live for? How long have they got to pay that to you for? So what we've seen in more recent years is, you know, defined benefit schemes are few and far between in terms of being able to actively join one. Um, and instead, we've seen the replacement, which is the defined contribution scheme, where what you know, what you, you know what, you're being, what you're putting in and what your employer is putting in, but ultimately, unlike a defined benefit scheme, what you get out at the other end is unknown. So ultimately, the risk has shifted from the employer over to the employee. Another key change, which again, I'm sure I don't really need to talk too much on, on, on this point, but pension freedoms uh, was, was, was announced back in 2014 and come into effect in 2015. Um, now, prior to 2015, most people used their defined contribution schemes to buy an annuity. Um, since 2015, there's been a, a greater swing towards the drawdown option or people accessing your, their pensions and cashing out, etc. So, so now with pension freedoms, you've very much got you know, the freedom to do as you please. Um, you, know, you can take what you want, when you want and how you want it. And then finally, we've got what we call the death of retirement, which basically, going back to the previous slide, where you work for your career, you then stop and retire, that's actually not so common in this day and age. And in actual fact, of the customers that I speak to, it tends to look like this. So under pension freedoms, you now have the ability to access some lump sums earlier if you want to, and then you can defer taking your income. So in this example here, you'll see that someone may, you know, before 60, want to pay off their mortgage. However, they're still working and they tend to, you know, they're still working up to age 65 at which point they may then have their defined benefit scheme and state pension start to pay out. But even then, they may not want to give up work. You know, I do see a lot of customers wanting to continue working beyond their 
normal retirement, um, you know, whether that's with their same employer or actually embarking on a new career. And then over that period of time, they may also t access some additional lump sums as well, you know, cover the cost of a, you know, a wedding when they go part time, I'm sorry, a holiday when they go part time or, or a wedding, you know, if, if, um, if one of the children gets married. So it's a lot more flexible in terms of how you access your pensions now and it's not as clear as what it used to be and everyone's circumstances are different. Now obviously it will depend on what pensions you do have. So you know, for some people they may not have a defined benefit scheme so it could look a lot different. So we're going to move on to the at retirement market now um, and you know, what are your options? Now generally speaking there's, there's four main sources of income that you can have in retirement. Um, from pensions only. So I'm only really going to be talking about pensions, won't be sort of discussing anything sort of outside of pensions like rental property, etc. But there are five key features that are quite key to, to, to our customers, um, which is along the top there. So, you know, potential to protect against inflation, longevity, big unknown, how long do we need this money to last us for? You know, do you want a predictable income? Is, is market volatility a concern? Do you want some flexibility to pay for that wedding? Um, and finally, do you want to leave something to your beneficiaries? So we go for each of the four options individually and we start off with income drawdown. So income drawdown covers some of those features. You have the potential there to keep pace with inflation. The only risk is there is will your pot of money last you? And that goes on to the third feature there, which is market volatility. The issue of drawdown is normally you will be invested and therefore subject to the, the ups and downs of the markets. And the markets perform badly and inflation's high and you're withdrawing high amounts of income, then actually you may run out of money quite early on and therefore not meet the longevity feature. But the advantages of, of drawdown are primarily the flexibility. You've got the flexibility to take money when you want it. Also, the ability to leave death benefits to your loved ones. So if you pass away with money left over in your pension, you can then leave that to your nominated beneficiaries. The next item is the lifetime annuity, which I'm sure quite a few of you will be familiar with. Um, now, a lifetime annuity works differently. And as you can see here, it does have the potential to keep pace with inflation, but that is subject to you choosing an option on the annuity to do that. So with an annuity, you can construct it how you see fit everyone's annuities will be different. You can have it increasing with inflation, which will mean it will start off lower and gradually increase, or you can start have it not increasing, whereby it starts off higher but never increases at all. The good thing about an annuity is it's guaranteed for the rest of your life, so it, it covers the longevity. And regardless of what the markets are gonna do, it's guaranteed. So if markets do go down, at least your income is still paying. Now, Generally speaking, you won't have the flexibility with an annuity. It's a fixed income for the rest of your life. And potentially you could have some death benefits there for your loved ones. It depends on the feature that you include. Now, one thing that has come out of the pension freedoms is the improvement of death benefits to an annuity. Um, a lot of my customers do say, I don't want to buy an annuity because once the insurance company has it, that's it. I don't, I'm not guaranteed to get it back. Well, actually, under pension freedoms, there are some new death benefits that are available um, where you can, in the scenarios that I've seen, guarantees to actually get your money back even if you pass away quite early on. So I would suggest if, if you're put off with an annuity because of that, I would suggest you do your research, get some quotations, research the open market and just see what the rates are because sometimes you, can, you, you could be surprised. Then we've got the defined benefit scheme. So the defined benefit scheme is very similar to the lifetime annuity. The only difference is your employer is paying it to you. So it works effectively in the same way. And then you've got the state pension, which is similar to the lifetime annuity and the defined benefit scheme. The main difference really is it's only really payable to you. Now, as you can see there, out of those four main income options for, for, for retirement, not one of them actually covers all of the key features that or concerns that a lot of customers will have in retirement. So what's the solution? Well, potentially combining it all. If you combine you know, two or three of the above or four, even all four of them, then at least you're covering off each, 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 each uh, feature there. 
So what I'm going to look at now is I'm going to focus primarily on, 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 on drawdown for the remainder of this, uh, this presentation. So, um, so you've got Flexi Access Drawdown now, which, you know, what does that mean? Well, it, it gives you the ability to re retain control of your assets. So unlike the annuity where you pass the money over to the insurance company, you keep control of the assets. Now, that does mean you also keep co con control of the risk. You keep your funds invested, generally speaking, and the idea being is over time, with some growth and some withdrawals, you know, the money hopefully will last you, and obviously there's no guarantee there. But the key advantages of, of drawdown is obviously the potential for the growth, but also the ability to access the pension when you want it. So you can access your income when you want it, you can access lump sums when you want it. Now, the other, issue, the other main good feature of it is actually, unlike an annuity, which once you've brought it, that's it, a drawdown arrangement gives you the option to come back and reconsider your options at a later stage. So, you know, if annuity rates were to increase in the future, for example, then they may become more attractive, in which case you could then look to purchase one. And as mentioned on the previous slides, one of the key advantages of drawdown is, you know, anything that is left over will be available to your nominated beneficiaries. So I'm going to give you an example of how drawdown can work. Now, drawdown can be, can be dealt with in, in, in one of two ways, really. You can either go into full drawdown, which is this option here. Now, if you imagine the circle um, is your pension, it's your pension wrapper. Under pension freedoms, in theory, if you've got a defined contribution scheme, you can access it however you like. You can take your tax-free cash, you can take an income. Now, of course, that will be subject to your, your, your pension provider's individual rules. Just because it's legislation doesn't mean your provider has to offer it. If they don't offer it, then you may have to then transfer it to an alternative product that does offer it. But assuming that your pension, which represents a circle, you can access it as through drawdown. Um, what for draw full drawdown is, is basically where you've got a pot of money. So in this scenario, you've got £200,000 and you want to access your full tax-free cash entitlement. Now, for the vast majority of people, the maximum tax-free cash will be 25% of the value of your pension. So in this scenario, you can take 25% of 200,000, which gives you the 50,000 pounds tax-free cash. What that does, it has the effect of what's known as, is what's known as a benefit crystallization event. So at that point that you take your tax-free cash, you're testing your pension against your lifetime allowance and using up a percentage of your lifetime allowance. With the remaining 75% of your funds, that will also be tested against your lifetime allowance. And it will be tested at the point that the money is actually left in drawdown. So by taking your tax-free cash, you will be moving into drawdown if that's what you do and keeping in the pension. Now you do have the option to take your tax-free cash and then buy an annuity with the rest of it. But in this scenario, we're assuming you're staying in drawdown. Now, when, with those pension funds, the 150,000, that stays in the pension. You can then withdraw an income from there, if you wish, or not. It's up to you. you don't, just because you're in drawdown doesn't mean you physically have to draw down. But any withdrawals you do make from the, the pension funds, the 150,000, will be subject to your marginal rate of income tax. Now, of course, you could be withdrawing it within your personal allowance and no tax would be due, but generally speaking, it will be subject to income tax. Now, what will then happen is those pension funds are still in your, in your pension. Um, they're now drawdown funds. You can withdraw from it if you want or not. The money is likely to, be, to remain invested. Um, and then hopefully, as time goes on, that 150,000 will continue to grow. Now, because you have done a full crystallization event, a full drawdown, no matter how much that 150,000 pounds grows by, you can take no further tax-free cash. You've already exhausted that upon the full drawdown. So the other option is what's known as partial drawdown. And this actually is also very similar to, some of you may have heard of the term uncrystallized fund pension lump sum, or UF plus for short. Um, this is a form of an UF plus, but it is actually called partial drawdown. It, it does work quite similar. So in this scenario, you've still got the 200,000 pounds. But in this situation, you'll see we're only taking out £25,000 as tax-free cash. So we're only partially drawing down or partially crystallising that benefit crystallisation event. Now, the advantage of this is you're actually only taking out what you need at that time. So if we assume that you, know, you want to buy a new car and you want £25,000 to do so, 
Well, what you can do here is you can withdraw your £25,000 tax-free cash, but in order to do that, you've only got to move £100,000 into drawdown, of which then 25% will come out tax-free. Your remaining £100,000 will stay as non-drawdown funds. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is the 75,000 on the drawdown side, you can withdraw from it as a taxable income. Now, again, as per the previous slide, that value could go up or down. If it does continue to go up, for example, no further tax-free cash can be taken. But the 100,000 pounds that's not in drawdown, that again will, can go up or down with markets, depending on the performance. But for example, if that, if that grew over time to 200,000 pounds, because it's non-drawdown, you've not yet touched it, you can still take 25% of whatever that value does as tax-free cash. Now, of course, that will be subject to upper lifetime allowance limits, but the method of this is actually, it just means that you keep most of your pensions in your pension, which is a tax-efficient wrapper, rather than having to withdraw the whole lot in one go if you don't need it. So it just gives you that extra bit of flexibility. Um, in terms of what you move into drawdown, it's really ultimately up to you. I mean, some providers may have minimums, but, you know, for example, you may say, well, I want £10,000 worth of income this year. So what you could do in that situation is you could move £10,000 into drawdown, release 25%, 2500 tax-free, and then you could withdraw the additional £7,500 as taxable income. And in that scenario, you'd still have £190,000 sat in non-drawdown funds. So partial drawdown gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of what you withdraw, and it also gives you the potential to make withdrawals in a tax-efficient manner. If we went back to the previous slide where you took that whole lump sum out, that lump sum is now coming into your estate and therefore adding to the value of your estate. So if inheritance tax is an issue for you, that might not be the right thing to do. So again, it's, it's looking at what's right for you. Now, with drawdown, there is, a, there is an element of risk versus reward here. So, so, so what this, this graph here demonstrates is Assuming you've got the £200,000 as per the previous slide um, and you start off at age 65 with £200,000 and you want to withdraw £10,000 a year every year for the rest of your life, increasing with inflation. What we've done here is we've, we've run a thousand different economic scenarios. So assuming that your fund is invested and markets, we have a thousand different you know, market scenarios, good scenarios and bad scenarios. <laughs> You know, what could happen to that £200,000 over time as you're making those withdrawals? Now, the blue lines represent each one of those 1,000 scenarios. And what the system here is recognising is that you're withdrawing an income at the same time. Now, as you can see, the lines generally go in a downward direction, but that's because you're withdrawing the income to your life expectancy. If you want your pension to you know, last over your life expectancy, then you know, hopefully you want to make sure that by the time you get to your life expectancy, you've, you've still got money to support you. But there is a risk. And the risk is, which unfortunately is not that clear on this graph, but on, this, um, on, on this screen, but the fund can actually run out pretty much where that arrow is if the markets perform badly. So the risk with drawdown is there's no guarantee. This goes back to longevity. If the fund doesn't perform and you continue making those withdrawals, then you run the risk that the fund could run out. But with, with risk, there's the potential for reward. Now, again, unfortunately, it's not very clear on this screen, but actually there are some blue lines which are running up to where that green arrow is now. So potentially, if markets do well over, over, over the years, then actually, by withdrawing £10,000 a year increasing with inflation, you could almost have the same amount as you put in originally. And if you do pass away at your life expectancy, then that would be left to your beneficiaries. Now, of course, the issue here is no, none of us in this room know how, you know how long we're gonna live for. So it is important if you do go into drawdown, the investment strategy is right and you review your withdrawals on a regular basis. So to summarize on drawdown, investment strategy is key. Depending on what you want to do, how you want you know, the income paid out to you, etc., having the right investment strategy is, is, is crucial for drawdown. You then want to look at your lump sum requirements. Now, by taking the large you know, tax-free cash lump sum at the outset, you know, it may not be the right thing to do. You may not need it, you know, but you could actually keep it in the pension through the partial drawdown. And by adopting that method, it just means there's more money left in the pot to hopefully benefit from any future growth. 
and also you could actually look to withdraw the money in a tax efficient manner. And obviously your income requirement, how much you actually need is key. You know, that you've got to strike the right balance. You don't want to take too much out that it ends up reducing your fund value very quickly. But then again, you don't want to hold too much back that you know, it results in you know, your, your quality of life and retirement reducing. And at the end of the day, the money is there for you to enjoy retirement. So I'm also now just going to give you a quick overview of um, quite, quite a, a, a topic that I'm having probably a lot more conversations with customers about now than I was having perhaps sort of five or six years ago. So in terms of your, your pensions, um, there's no limit on how much you hold in a pension. You can hold as much as you like. The only issue is there is a limit on the tax relief you get, over, and that's over your lifetime. So that's known as a lifetime allowance, which as of today is one million pounds. From April next, next month, it's due to increase to 1.03 million pounds. Now, once upon a time, the lifetime allowance used to be as high as 1.8 million. It has come down every year since 2012. Um, this year will be the first year that's actually starting to increase again. From next year, so April 19, it's due to increase again in line with the, the consumer prices index at that, that time. And then it's going to increase every year thereafter by, by the consumer prices index. Now at the moment you can apply for some protection. So if you are close to the one million pounds or you think that's going to be a problem for you in the future, you can apply for some protection. There's two types of protection available. There's fixed protection 2012 and uh, sorry 2016 and individual protection 2016. Now that is subject to certain qualifying criteria and the maximum that either of those protections will give you as a protection will be 1.25 million pounds. So if you, you know, if you are close to it, then it might be worth investigating that. Um, you can go online and apply for it via the government's website. Um, but as I said, it is subject to certain qualifying criteria. So what happens when you're over the lifetime allowance? Well, initially nothing. If your pension funds grow to a million pounds, nothing happens. It's at the point that you start to access your pensions. So depending on how and when you access your pensions, I mean, if you go back to the full drawdown option, you crystallise all of your pensions at the same time. So therefore, all of the pension that you're, all of your drawdown pension at the same time, which means it's then tested against your lifetime allowance at that time. Now that will use up a percentage. So if you've got a million pounds in your drawdown accounts and you access the whole lot in one go, that's going to use up 100% of your lifetime allowance. If you had 1.1 million pounds in your drawdown account and you, you access the whole lot in one go, then you're going to have 100,000 pounds over the lifetime allowance. And because you're crystallizing it all at the same time, you're testing it against your lifetime allowance at the same time, and you're exhausting 100% of your lifetime allowance, a tax charge will be due at that point. And the tax charge will be between 25% to 55%, depending on what you do with the money over your lifetime allowance. Now, if you go for the partial drawdown route, what you're doing in that situation is you're testing little bits of your pension each time you go into partial drawdown. So each time you do that, you will use up a percentage of your lifetime allowance, which will slowly build up over time until the point that it gets to 100% and then potentially that tax charge could come in. Now, in terms of those tests, so taking your tax-free cash is a test against your lifetime allowance. Moving into drawdown is a test against your lifetime allowance. Buying an annuity is a test. Passing away potentially is a test. Transferring overseas is a test. There's actually 13 different events that could be triggered over your lifetime that could result in your pensions being tested against your lifetime allowance. This is quite a complex area because of those various different tests. In some situations, it is possible that your pension funds can be tested twice on the same funds. So again, you need to be clear that you understand what tests will be due and when, especially if you're close to the lifetime allowance. So what should we be thinking, just to summarise? So the first thing to do, like with anything, make a plan, understand you know, exactly what you've got and what you're looking to achieve. You then want to be looking at, okay, what's, what's important? You know, you're going to have an idea of how much income you would like in retirement, but there's diff a difference between what you would like and what you need. So work out what's your essential expenditure. You know, you know, what is you know, your council tax, your gas, your electric, your food, etc. 
Those are your essential costs. That, you know, that's what keeps the roof over your head. It isn't a bad idea to have sources of guaranteed income to at least cover that. So if you, if you do then invest the rest of your money and markets do not perform as well as expected, then at the very least, the essentials are covered. What shouldn't you really be thinking? Well, what, you know, what, you know, what else do you need to think about? Well, you know, do you need that lump sum, that whole lump sum straight away? Now, depending on what product you go for, you may have no option but to either take the full lump sum, a reduced lump sum, or no lump sum. If you, don't, if you take a reduced lump sum or a small lump sum, you know, for example, for an annuity, there's no option of going back to get the rest of the tax-free cash later on, whereas drawdown at least gives you that, that flexibility. And then the other thing at the moment, which is quite a hot topic, is, is, is giving up a guaranteed income, such as you know, a, a defined benefit scheme. Um, you know, a lot of people at the moment are, are aware that transfer values from defined benefit schemes are, are, are high. Um, and a lot of people are looking to potentially give up a transfer. Now, generally speaking, it's not in your interest to give that up. Um, and just because someone at work, your friend, someone you know has done it, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do for you. Everyone's pensions are different. Everyone's circumstances are different. You know, assets that you have, income sourcey from other, you know, from other areas are different. So, so you know, just because everyone else is doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for you. So that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to discuss today. Um, we are here today for Fidelity. We're located at stand 30 to 32. I will be there uh, for the rest of the day. Um, and so will some of my retirement specialist colleagues. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to pop down and see us. Um, yeah, so we're more than happy to you know, answer any questions you may have. Uh, we've even got a, a free barista bar there as well for a cup of coffee if you fancy it. Um, we also have our relationship managers there um, and uh, they'll be able to talk you through our wealth service, which is available for customers that um, come to Fidelity with assets um, over the value of 250,000. So you know, please pop along and come and see us. Um, but other than that, thank you for your time this morning. I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you.